Our first guest here is Charmaine Williams, a seasoned servant and community leader who has dedicated her career to making a positive difference in the life of others. First as a counselor for the city of Brampton and now as a member of provincial parliament. Charmaine is an advocate for important issues such as mental health, social justice, and education, and has worked tirelessly to promote equality and inclusivity. These are values that she's able to put into action in her role as the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunities. Charmaine's passion for public service and commitment to social changes are truly inspiring and we are honored to have her to join us today. Next, we have Daisy Wei, a trailblazing entrepreneur, author, and speaker. Since 2018, member of Provincial Parliament for Richmond Hill, throughout her career, Daisy has overcome incredible challenges to achieve success. As a former software engineer, Daisy knows firsthand the obstacle faced by women and minorities in the tech industry and has dedicated herself to creating more opportunities for underrepresented groups. No matter what role she's in, Daisy never hesitates to share her expertise in technology, leadership, and entrepreneurship and encourages others to pursue their passion and dreams. Her resilience, determination, and innovation are truly remarkable. We are privileged to have her today. And now the wonderful, lovely host, Lena. Lena, isn't she a superwoman? Yes. yes. Lena, as a lot of you know, she's a real estate advisor, certified life and business coach, and public speaker who's passionate about helping others achieve their full potential. She has co-founded six successful companies, including Envy Property Management and Stilettos and Hammer. Lena has helped countless individual and organization overcome obstacles and achieve their goals. Her dedication to empowering others is truly remarkable. We are very fortunate for her to bring all of us here together. So thank you, Lena. Thank you. So Nadira is why we're all here with the lovely minister and MPP Way. So big round of applause to her as well. And we're going to get the party started. Are you going with that? So how many of you have been here to a Stilettos and Hammers event for the very first time? Okay, so let me tell you about Stilettos first, if you don't mind. We're awesome, obviously. But I created Stilettos and Hammers in 2012 because as a female in the world of real estate investing, I was not taken seriously. I was not treated very nicely because I looked young. When we started out, I had no idea what I was doing, and that was obvious. And the men that dominated the markets that I was in just thought that I was this cute little joke that they could play around with. And I realized I'm probably not the only person this is happening to. So I wanted to create an environment where women could come and feel safe and welcomed and acknowledged and validated so that we would be able to you know, build our wealth together and create our own little community. And it's been wonderful. And now we're just expanding because, you know, real estate is a business. And there are a lot of women right now, especially with COVID, who have had to pivot and look at self-employment options because they've realized they need that flexibility to be with their children or to care for their families or whatever else those challenges might be. And why don't we help you guys get the tools that you need so that we can thrive and contribute to this world because we are Awesome. So welcome. And I'm so excited to have these two incredible women with us. I mean, MPP Way, you have four children. Minister Williams, you have five. <laughs> and I can barely manage one. My first question to the both of you would be really with such, I mean, incredible careers to begin with, both of you, um, and such busy families, what made you shift? your focus into public service? Because now not only are you responsible for your family, you're responsible for your constituents. And, you know, I can speak for myself and many of my neighbors. Sometimes we're not very reasonable human beings. <laughs> so what would make you guys want to create that shift? 
Well, first, hi, everyone. Um, thanks. This is it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having us and putting this together. I think anytime you have women in the room talking, some great stuff is going to happen. And I usually substitute the S word for the other word, but I won't because I miss Daisy way. I feel like I have to be on my best behavior. <laughs> I'm in your neighborhood. <laughs> well, really, I, um, I've always been in public service, I guess you could say. I, I worked in children's mental health for almost 20 years before I uh, thought about politics. But I have to say, as women, when we're women in leadership, we really need to plant seeds in other women when we're around women, because we all have the potential to be leaders. And so I had no interest in politics. I love what I was doing. I was working with families in the community who were experiencing challenges like poverty, um, domestic violence, mental health, um, challenges that were very real, um, that really took a toll on the, the cycle of health for generations and many of the families that I would work with. And uh, so I love doing that work, helping see um, people make behavioral shifts to health to get better. But it was in 2014 when a good friend of mine won um, a regional councillor spot um, in, in her election in her area. And seeing her go through an election, and she's a mom of four, and just take it on, I was blown away. And I thought, that is great for her. I am so happy for her. After she won, she kept saying to me, you need to be at the table, Charmaine. If you get, like, if you could even just sit at a regional council meeting, which nobody does, um, you'd be amazed at what decisions and discussions are happening about the community, about you, that these people don't have that same connection, right? Some do in council, but it, it was a municipal politics. So she's like, you'd be amazed of what decisions are being made you should be at the table. And I'd be like, that's great. Not interested in politics. It's a popularity contest. I'm not interested. But every time she, I saw her, we hung out for her four-year term, she would say that. So she kept watering that seed that she planted when she won in 2014. Now, as we're approaching 2018, I still wasn't interested in politics, but she was on her last year, but I was pregnant with my fifth baby, Malcolm. I was pregnant, and anybody knows what it's like to be pregnant, right? Like, and I have four kids, and um, the age competition, composition, like my oldest right now is gonna be 19 in June, wild. Um, uh, the next one is 12, twins are 11, and Malcolm's five. Right, yeah, so I've got twins in there. So I'm like, I'm pregnant. I'm not doing this politics thing. But anyway, I would always tell myself, um, because we do this, we second guess everything. And I would always tell myself, I can't do it. That is for somebody else's success. I'm a great cheerleader for other people. But when it came to me, I was like, no, just do what you know. So I uh, had Malcolm on September 23rd. 2017. But my life changed six days after I had him because I suffered a massive brain hemorrhage. And that brain hemorrhage changed my whole life completely. And it changed my whole outlook on life. I survived that brain hemorrhage. It was touch and go. And, but I was, I have this drive in me and I realized that, you know, I have a second chance at this life that I've been blessed with. And I cannot tell myself I can't do things because life is too short. And so I really had a mind shift, brain hemorrhage, mind shift. And I, and I started um, accepting the challenges that would come my way with a different perspective. And so when my friend came to me after I'd gotten full clearance from the neurologist in May of 2018, she said to me, we're coming up to the next municipal election. Are you interested in running? And I said, yeah, I'll go for it. And I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> but I ran in that election. And I did it because my experience working with families taught me that we need to have more people at the table and to be involved 
in those conversations where decisions are being made that will impact the success of every human being. And so I ran in that election, I won it. I became the first black woman ever elected to Brampton City Council. And that continued the journey, it opened the door. It opened the door for provincial and I ran provincially because of the work I did in social services for years. And I said, I need to be at that table provincially because I know there are some important discussions and important decisions that are being made within the ministries that if I'm at that table, I know I can have an impact on so many families and, and women now that I'm the Minister for Women, Social and Economic Opportunities. So in a very long-winded answer, that's how I became involved in politics. <laughs> we very much appreciate that answer. Thank you so much. Incredible. Show <laughs> her some love. MPP Way. Yes. First of all, I will have to say thank you, Minister Williams, for sharing. Wow, five. I cannot believe it. Can you guys? You're four. <laughs> uh, my four is a lot older. But I would just have to say thank you for being a minister for women. Yes. Good afternoon, all ladies and gentlemen behind us there. But I would like to share thank you very much for asking me that questions. I have four, but it is easier on me because... My four children are bigger, bigger and older. Actually, I have already trained myself into a mindset that I've always have a very busy lifestyle because I'm working with advertising agencies. We have tight deadlines. Everything is fast, fast, fast. And whenever the client wants something, things has to get done. So I'm already very used to that. And when I take care of my children, I always have time for them. I will have to have time for them. I will make sure that I pick them up, all four of them. Uh, after they can, when they can close before six, you have to pick them up. I pick them up one, two, three, and it, it is very hard. But I leave sort of on time from my work. I take care of them, take bath, I'll cook and everything. Then I spend time in watching TV, Perfect Strangers. Do you guys still remember that? I'm that old. But anyway, I did spend time with them. And then after 10 o'clock will be my time that I start taking out all my stuff and start get, getting it done. So I'm quite used to that. And I'm very good in compartmentalized. <laughs> so that when I'm at work, I don't think about anything. I just think, well, and when I stand, I say, finally, I got a time to get, get, get out of there and going back to something easier and happier. When I, when I am done with that, it's just a lot of work, taking, gi giving them bath and everything, cooking and everything. I say, Whew, I'm ready to go back to work. So this is a good way. But let me tell you why I get into politics. I've always enjoyed serving in the community because I really wanted to give back to the community. And I'll tell you why later when I answer your other questions. But um, I, my children, as I say, are all grown up. My oldest one is 42. My next one is 40, 38. And then my youngest is 32. So it's, they're all grown up. I have been MPP for five years. The reason why I get myself into it is I have a lot of concern with the sex education at the time. When I think about it deeply, I have grandchildren. My grandchildren, the oldest one at that time is six. Okay, a good guess. How many grandchildren do you think I have? Not quite. <laughs> maybe, maybe that will be my seven, seven. I have my youngest one, I don't have any children yet, so he got married just two years. So very possible, ten. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, uh, I I feel that even though it is not for my grandchildren, but for the generation, next generation, I care about that. But I don't think I'm the one to really go in there and make a difference. I was convincing, I tried to identify people in their 40s and 50s. I convinced them, get into politics. If I get 10 of them, 
believing in this principle, holding hands together, march into Queen's Park and have the same idea and get changes, that will, we will have the right kind of changes for all of us. But I don't have the response I want. The 40s, I realize that they are too busy with their families because the children may be young and all that. And when they turn 50s, they are starting to be very successful with a career. And they're starting to be too busy with a career. And um, I don't have the response I got. Then I realize talking is cheap. Don't just talk the talk, walk the walk. I say, what? Me? No. I do feel the calling. And I say, no, 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 not me. It takes me four months to finally settle down. I say, okay, I put myself forward, but it doesn't mean that I'll get elected. Everybody will know that if it is your first time to go for election, you just learn some experience. And at least I can tell myself that I have done the work and I've tried, but I have no intention that I got elected. And I got elected and I beat the minister at that time by doubling, by doubling his votes. He got 12,000, I got 24,005. I say, what? So if that is the case, I'll put myself forward. I'll do my best. And I learn on the job, but I find it is really rewarding. Something that I find is a great honor and great blessing. How can I manage the work? Uh, I still have to learn from you, Minister Williams. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> but uh, my children are all grown up. They have the family of their own. They want to have their own way of raising the children. And I, I, could, I respect that. I don't want to be like the mother-in-law of everybody love Raymond, <laughs> knocking on their door all the time. So I, I have not been intruding. I am thankful that uh, my younger son is in Calgary. So I have all the time, in fact, and I'm happy that my husband is taking an early retirement so he can be there to support me, to be with me all the time. So I'm okay. I will put myself forward the best I can. I find it an honor and a blessing. And thank, thank you. you for giving me that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's amazing. So I think that we can agree that MPP weighs win by double is a sign of just how much society would like some female energy in the positions of leadership. Absolutely. So it's time for us to just step up, own it and go for it and just take advantage of everything that we have because the world needs it. The universe is ready to receive our energy and it's apparent in everything that's happening. I'm going to now speak to you, Minister Williams. Um, you've basically set history. You are the first Black woman to have been elected into cabinet for First Black PC. person. Yeah. I mean, person. there you go. First Black person. And I mean, an accomplishment like that is something that our children, our grandchildren, they're going to be reading about this, learning about this. And I mean, forever you're going to be known. What else do you want them to remember you for when it comes to you as our Associate Minister of Women, Social and Economic Opportunity? Loaded question. No, dum dum dum. You know, I, I, I always just think it's important that as I, I go through life that I am uh, being as, as authentic as possible. I am a woman, I am a mom, I'm a black woman, it's difficult. It's a difficult place to be when, you know, you're you're charting a path that is no one has ever charted before. Um, and and I want people to know that I, we are blessed to live in a country that creates the opportunity for these paths. And I know, you know, people say, "Well, I can do. You can do it too." It's it's true. Like if I can do it, I. I immigrated from England when I was like a year. <laughs> my parents are Jamaicans um, and my grandparents are Jamaicans, but my parents moved to England. That there's There are threads of values that run through because my grandparents are from the Windrush generation who left from Jamaica to go to England. They're risk takers. And because my parents 
moved from England to set a life here in Canada. My dad is one of five, and he's the only one that came to Canada that left England. My parents are risk takers. And I took the chance and ran for office. I know I'm a risk taker. And so I just want all of you in the room to know there are certain values and parts of you that give you the authority to do great things. We have to tap into that. Life has its challenges, and I'm a huge advocate for therapy, all right, to go and learn about yourself, because when you know about yourself, that path is easier to follow down because you're going to do it with so much authenticity. I hope that as a leader, people can see me as a person that is here for everyone, that sees me as a person that wants to genuinely see everyone do well. And that the policies that I work on in my ministry or any ministry that I have, there's that consistent thread. I'm here for everyone in this country because we're immigrants. We are longtime members of this community. So whether you're new or, or not, I understand that narrative and that there are so many opportunities. So the work I do is genuinely for everyone, every person in this country. But because I'm a woman, I'm sorry, guys, <laughs> but <laughs> it's our time, right? It's our time. There are so many women who are leaders, but we've never embraced our leadership. And as a country, I don't think we have. In Ontario, we haven't. Because now as I unpack and peel back all the layers and I start to explore and ask questions, I'm seeing women at every single leadership table. It's wonderful, right? It's encouraging. It's encur and it's, it's so encouraging. So encouraging. But we don't know that. Why? Because we don't talk about it. We were just talking about menopause, <laughs> and they're like, "We are right, right? Isn't that the best seed in the house? Because we don't talk about it. We got to start talking about it. Our lives, right? Like, are it these things? But this is what I mean. We got to start talking about the leaders in the room. So, I policies, anything I work on." is going to have that lens. It's amazing. Thank you. We appreciate having somebody with such intention and such force, you know, being our voice, really. Because at the end of the day, ladies, she's our voice, right? She's well, the women. person who will be speaking out. MPP Way, you're our voice, right? So we are new business owners here in Richmond Hill. I mean, I've been in Richmond Hill for a while, but like as a business owner, this is a very new venture for us. We've been here about a year. And it's interesting when we look at what it is that's going on compared to Vaughn, where we were, or Ottawa, where we were prior, there seems to be so much opportunity. So for you as our MPP, what are some of the key points that you have found as an entrepreneur? What do you think are some of the opportunities that we have here in the city? that, you know, you're fighting for us for. I would like to share with you that I have been an entrepreneur and I have been running my business for almost 25 years before I move in to become a politician. I also have to encourage all of you that being a woman to run a business, it has been hard when I first know that like, how I was being picked to run a business is I was laid off. Uh, for from a big ad, ad agency. I was a VP there, but uh, out of a lot of people that were laid off, they picked only 35 in uh, South Toronto. I would live in Atlington. I was not in, in um, Richmond Hill at that time. So I was one of the 35 being picked. Let me just encourage you guys. We have a very, very good government. They look at us because I am a female, I got extra point to get selected. And because I have children, I got extra point. And because I am a minority, I've got extra point. But still, after being selected to help me to run a business, I say, how can I do that? Being a female, being a minority, I have no clients. I need money to put food on the table. We have a family of six. How can I do that? I thank the Lord for the government, really, the training is good. So I'm thankful. In five years, I make 
a lot of money that I had not even dreamed of in maybe six years after uh, I started my companies, I got recognized by the Richmond Hill. At that time, it's called the Chamber of Commerce. It's now the Board of Trade. And I got a Business Achievement Award from them. And then I got Ontario Chamber of Commerce giving me an award. I say, what is that? So I encourage all of you, like being women, this country, Canada, Ontario, is giving us a lot of opportunity grab that and just do the best we can opportunities will come to you when you're genuine doing your best to serve i contributed back to the community and i thought i will contribute back to the community i never thought myself to be a politician after we got elected i tell the premier i don't want to serve i could have got into economic development and all those other areas but i said I have done enough of that for 25 years. I want to do something that is totally not associated with business, with uh, trade. I've taken a lot of Canadians to do international trade as well, but um, I would not want to do that. I want to serve seniors, not only because I'm becoming a senior, <laughs> but more so is because I see that the senior population is growing so fast. We need that. And I want to do something where I can put my heart out there. And now I am the parliamentary assistant for the Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility. And I find it so encouraging because I've served on, served on the board with Mackenzie Health, mainly because I want to make sure that senior will be well taken care of in the time of their need, especially if they have language barrier, and if they need the younger generation to take care of them. So I'm happy that I'm in that role that I am allowed to serve. And I am thankful that I can serve the seniors. It's amazing. So I'm going to plug ourselves the Business Achievement Award that you won. I was nominated for this year for Flex Space. So I'm just going to be like, hey, I'm going to own it. I'm um, so... I mean, it's just so inspirational. Now, ladies, you, you guys. get it. You will. Hey, we've only been around a year. The fact that they even recognized us is more than I could possibly ask. And in a few more years, we're going to dominate and it'll be fine. Then I'll win. That's right. <laughs> then I'll win. <laughs> but ladies, we heard that our government is here to support us. So I would like to now get into the real nitty gritty of what type of opportunities are there for us? as women, as entrepreneurs, as women who are looking to expand our horizons, whether it is through career training and expansion, whether it is to set up our own businesses or whatnot, what type of programs are there currently available for us to be able to take advantage of, both on provincial level, on a municipal level? And where would we go to find this information? Because it can be overwhelming. I've tried to Google it and it doesn't help. I don't know. Maybe now we have to ask chat GTP or whatever that thing is. <laughs> the, 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 what is it? A robot or AI? AI. 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 My husband's not there. The guys in the back are like, oh, what about that? Well, you know, it's, it's funny you ask that because um, I often, whenever I meet with women in, in groups like this, I ask, how do you find information? And the consensus is it's difficult to find. So that is something I'm working on, how to make business information accessible to women. We don't have time to search everything or we don't have time to go and, and to a location. But if we know where it is, we're going to access it. So one thing we do through the economic development is we do um, fund RIC centers, which are regional innovation centers. And those places are, we have about 17 in Ontario and there are other locations um, where we fund municipalities and they should have business development centers. So I'm in Brampton. We have back the Brampton Entrepreneur Center uh, on George Street. And, and so um, I can't remember. I think the one, there's one in Markham as well that is a RIC center. And I can find out specifically where the one is close to you. Those are locations where they have people who are paid to help you navigate the business world, understand what pathways are accessible to you and what funding past streams are available. Um, I'm really big on uh, making sure that women have access to loans and, and to the funding needed to expand your business. During COVID, 
we had the digital main street because we had to pivot, right? Everything was online. Um, we have different fund streams like um, the Futurepreneur, for example, that people can access. But one of the things I am talking about within groups is addressing the risk, you know, the risk <laughs> factors that prevent women from getting um, loans in banks. Often right now, banks need to reassess. And I think Scotia Bank right now is looking, reassessing all of their risk factors that are excluding women from business. So I've been talking about this a lot at a ministry level. They automatically see women in business or when your business only has one or two employees as high risk. But when women's businesses are invested in, they have state data to prove it. Women pay back their loans faster and they have longer success rate, higher success rates than businesses that are not led by women. 100%. How many of you agree? How many of you would say that if you and another individual who is not a female <laughs> were to do exactly the same thing that you're doing today, that you would be approaching that with much more care, with much more empathy, compassion, as well as caution to ensure that everybody that you are involved with is taken care of versus writing set, go, I'll <laughs> figure it all out later. Exactly. So, so that's we're, amazing. We're looking at it. And I also, in my ministry, we have the Investing in Women's Futures program. And that is a program where if women, women can get um, in-demand skills for work that is available out there, also wraparound supports. So women who are in high risk um, situations, right, and are either leaving uh, abuse, but it's not just for women who are in domestic um, violent situations, but it is a place for women to upskill and learn about what the job markets are like and, and get access to those in-demand skills or even a door open to those sectors where women are underrepresented. Our government is also investing heavily in seeing women engage in the trades. And I know you're stilettos and hammers, so we but are. we want to see also women building as well, right? That's what we're here for. Every one of us is here. And I would love to actually have that little bit of a discussion because there are quite a few of us in this room right now who are looking at providing solutions, let's say, for seniors. I know myself, um, we own a property management company. We own investment real estate. And during COVID, when there was the mass exodus from the university towns, one thing that our company did is we actually converted all of those student rentals into shared seniors living. So for us, because I am who I am, um, they're all women, <laughs> not on purpose, but it just works better. Um, but we noticed that within the communities, there were a lot of senior women. They are widowed. They're alone. They don't have the financial means to go into an independent retirement home. They're not in a position where they need care. They are still independent, but they don't have that social aspect. They don't have the companionship. And we just, we happen to have these homes that we started placing these women. And I'd, I'd say seniors, but they're not seniors. They're 55 and up. And they're older women, they're mature women, and they come in there. And it's worked really well. Like they're wonderful. They care for one another. They take care of each other's grandkids. The best model. And- there are a lot of us in here who would love the opportunity, just by a show of hands, how many of you would love to be able to build a building that will either provide affordable solutions for women, right? Women who are escaping, right? These are all huge things that we want to be able to do. And we would love to know how, because I'm sure anybody who has heard the landlord and tenant board is not very nice to investors. We're all going to put our feet down and complain about that. I don't 100% agree. I think some of it has to do with a little bit of a lack of understanding of the system. But are there opportunities, do you think, for private housing providers like us to be able to work within our region with the province to be able to create a solution that will provide protections on both sides so that we can bridge this gap? Because it's hard, right, for charities to be able to do that. Absolutely. We just passed Bill 23, which is More Homes Built Faster Act. And that bill, yes, it, it's a great that bill. To our, really give that to our government. It is a great bill that waives development charges and it incents development, especially for supportive housing. Um, and as we, right now, I'm noticing there's 
a huge need even for a second stage um, supportive housing for women fleeing domestic violence. Um, shelters are at capacity and women are staying in them longer. Um, but because we don't have enough rental units, women um, have nowhere to go or they have to leave their community where their social community network is to another part of Ontario and start over again. So um, we need to see more rental starts. And we've actually seen a significant increase in rental starts because of the policy and some of the acts that we moved um, we've moved four so far, um, move forward, um, and we're seeing more rental incomes and opportunities for supportive housing. So we're waiving development charges, and we're also really supporting developers who want to build um, when you reach meet challenges with municipalities, right? And, and municipalities are now getting on board and understanding that we need to build housing. We're seeing more things move forward which is a good thing. Um, that's And then also we're increasing the amount of um, adjudicators, the landlord and tenant board. We were increasing that significantly because we see the backlog and it's so challenging for landlords right now who are um, dealing with tenants that are not moving on. And then, yeah. We don't have those problems, do we ladies? Oh, no. you do? No, like, let's just no. straight. You do. And it hurts your bottom line. It's not cool. Yes. And we need, and that's why we're, we know we need to get this moving and uh, to give some relief to many of the landlords because it's not right and, and no, it needs to fix. It's not. And there are a lot of units being removed from the market for exactly 100% that reason. 100% for right? fear. It's, it's, they're like, it's scary. scary. I don't know how many of you can support a non paying tenant for a year. No. No. Only to hope that they don't stay their eviction order and, you know, appeal and all that other. We can't. It's brutal. So, MPP Way, what would you say are some of the opportunities maybe that we have regionally available to us? Places that we should start looking, how we can now contribute and work with the city to bridge these gaps? Yes. I, well, first of all, I cover a little bit more about housing. Uh, we, as a province, want to build 1.5 million more homes by 2031. It seems like a very aggressive plan, but we need that. If you can imagine, we all need that. We talk about the need right now, especially for affordable housing and rentals. So this is what the minister has been working very hard. And I thank Minister Williams for also voicing this out on behalf of a lot of the ladies, why we need that. And our government, especially the Minister for Housing, has been working very hard four bills passed very quickly, one after another, even um, even since 2018 he's been working on this, 2020 we have one, we have 21, we have 22, have one, but now he's passing on the fourth one. Yeah, we're debating really it. Really meaning, even though we are having like a 70% increase, but still it is not enough, it's still far from the 1.5 million that we're looking for. And I'm so thankful that the city of Richmond Hill also actually in March, they have a special council meeting to review the need. They are committed to support and make sure we provide 27,000, which is requested by the province to meet that need for by 2031 that we have, we do our share. I can tell, in fact, in Richmond Hill, there are not a lot of space still around. We also have to respect a lot of the Oak Ridges Moraine and the Green Belt. We have not touched. In Richmond Hill, we respect a lot of that, so we do the best we can. But there are a lot of needs. The needs of people, they need the housing, especially rental and especially for the affor affordable housing, which is why we say we waive the development charges Actually, just for the developers who are doing rentals and development uh, uh, affordable housing so that they can build it faster because those are the ones that we need. We are also discouraging the municipalities to charge so much development fees because uh, I know that municipalities say that they have the need in order to continue to get the city or whatever that they want to build, but we should not put it onto the back of our next generation or new immigrants or people who really save a lot of hard money trying to buy a new home. By the time they save enough, 
there is another race, and then there is another race. I still remember my daughter; she has her first house,、uh, a condominium. When she has her first baby, she still have that. When she had the second, she say, "I'm going to sell that. I'm going to move up closer to you, mom, but I'm going to rent." And I'll wait until that I'm more settled down, then I will buy. By now, she cannot afford to buy anything. She's the one growing from one to grandchildren for me. She had now has four. It is so hard. My my heart goes out to her. So yes, we do have a lot of need for affordable housing, as well as housing. Period. Yeah. So our government has been doing a lot on that. And back to your question, how does the city of Richmond Hill help? I think Minister Williams has already touched on a lot of what our province will be helping, especially for her in helping the women developing. Instead of Richmond Hill, the Economic Development Department, they do have somebody there to give you all the ins and outs of what is what is the best way and how to support you. They also have different kind of seminars. They also have different kind of fundings for you to hire、uh, co-workers for no cost. Some of them they cover some of the cost.、Uh, Ontario works people that you can help. You can hire them for a very reduced price, and that will also help your business to grow. In the city of Richmond Hill, I've been serving on the. I got the award from the. Uh, board of Trade, and I serve on the board、uh, as a way to pay back. I served with them for eight years. I was on the chair of the board, and I really work with the the older board members. We do have a lot of women who are running the business in Richmond Hill. A lot of the business in Richmond Hill, they are small businesses. So go out for it. You'll get a lot of support. We also have some the some events called. Women in Business Morning Digital、uh, is a, a, another way of really getting into the、um, the global business as well. Digital mainstream is the biggest one、uh, in Richmond Hill, so go after all those. They are all available.、Uh, we have BIA in Richmond Hill. I also belong to、uh, Richmond Hill、uh, Chinese Business Association. I have actually served with them for 25 years on the board. All I would encourage all of you is to go out, serve in the community. When you serve, that is the biggest advantage for you. I see it as a way that I don't have to pay for my tuition, like going into a university. I don't have to pay. They help me. That I learn a lot of things from them, and I make a lot of good friends. I couldn't even understand why I get so much votes. I guess <laughs> mainly because, because I、amazing. have been serving in the community for too long, and they know me. That's maybe is one of the reasons. Go out to serve. You get a lot, a lot more than you put out. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes.、Yeah. Thank you. So before we open it up, I can, I can sit here all day. I'm sure. But before we open it up to the audience, I wanted to circle back to the Rick. Centers、yeah. and this program because I think that it is important for all of us in here to fully understand what's available to us at these centers. So they're regional, regional innovation centers. Yep. Yeah. So wherever you guys are, is it something that we would look up maybe in? Yeah,、um, we have especially. Okay, so we'll make sure you know exactly where to look, and I want to say the the Ministry of Ontario website has them. I hate that. You're know, like, go search online. Then it's like, well, that's I would have found it because everybody searches everything online. Anyway, but um, you know what? They they really truly are great places. When we talk about innovation center, there are spaces like incubators for you to go and explore and connect with other business people, and and that is what is so important as entrepreneurs. It's that network and that community because sometimes when you're there. And you, there's an a, gr- a grant available, and some Rick centers you have grant writers there. How、right? many of you would love that? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Because you don't have time to run your business and then sit down at a computer and put together a whole. Yeah, no. Grant writers are wonderful people, right?、Um, I always connect with one, and when you have a good one, and also when you find a grant writer, 
uh, look at ask for their success, how many grants they've successfully gotten from the government, because some people collect a lot of money for grant writing, um, and but they might not be as successful. Do your homework on it. I also want to encourage when people are when you're writing your grant or when if you're especially maybe in the social enterprise sector, not for profit, always budget for marketing. Because I find as women in business, we don't think about marketing as much. We have a great idea. We love it. We know our friends love it. But then we need to get that message out. And marketing strategies are make or break businesses. Right. So Rick Sanders would offer that support around marketing access as well. Yeah, I just think, you know, I, groups like this are so important. I agree. No, it's hearted. true. It's so important. <laughs> we also have something called the called the RAISE grant, which is racialized indigenous. Um, I don't know what the other acronym is, but but it, it's for people in the BIPOC community who are at, you can apply for a grant. You can get up to 10,000 or a bit more for those grants for your business. Check those out. Those are through the BIAs. Um, they have a, a partnership with them. I just want to encourage all women. We are like the queens of the side hustle, but we know that our side hustle can move into that full time um, place. And and also, there the grants when it comes to interns and students, there are grants that provincial government, federal government offers that will pay you to hire students. Do it, please do it. It's money that you can get bodies into your business doing work for two to three months it's so valuable yes do That's it gold <laughs> ladies they're gonna pay you yes to hire, to hire students, students so that they can have the experience they need in order to be able to become contributing members of society they're paying you <laughs> Done. Hey. yeah right? please do it yes it's it incredible can. digital main street I don't think everybody knows what that is. I know what it is only because I've had the opportunity to be exposed to it through the Richmond Hill Board of Trade. Um, but I think that it's important for everybody here to get an understanding of what it is because it is money that is available to us right. in order to actually improve our online footprint, right? Exactly. Would you be able to tell us a little bit more? Sure. Sure. And I am so thankful that the Minister for Economic Development, and he see that, especially after pandemic, a lot of things are being online. A lot of things are done by Zoom. My son can be in Calgary, and yet he can still do the work for a U.S. company. Yeah. And that's how things are. Everything, this world is getting smaller. When we say digital, it's exactly what it means. That in the past, when I was asked to... Uh, try to do business, even with the states. I really don't know how to start, how to begin. But now, economic development, whether it's provincially or right in Richmond Hill, they can give you the hands-on and give you all the leads that you can. They will come in and study what your business are, and they will provide you with all the information. It's not only uh, Richmond Hill. York Region has a whole list as well. So go after all this and just see yourself that they are just a phone call away or just a Zoom away. You know, it's, it's very easy these days. This all of a sudden make us into a global partner. Yeah. Just recently, I was attending one of the award gala and this company said they only started the company for four years, which means they started it off when pandemic happens. They are now all over the world. So I encourage you to think big. You can do it. Women really understand how how to organize things and think things in a strategic way. And these days, while you are maybe at home putting your baby to sleep, then you can have the other time to do a lot of things. And people accept this. In the past, when I first have to run my business, you have to have an impressive office, have a good receptionist, have a lot of different things to make sure that you impress your clients. But now these days you don't. Bigger companies will have to shrink down in order to save money. And the client respect that a lot more because they know that you're saving money. Hopefully it will pass back on to them. Okay. 
So yes, you can do it. Um, even if you have your home base office, just go for it. This is what our government wants us to grow and grow big. As long as we we have the uh, we have the ability in serving our clients wherever they are. Trust yourself. We in Ontario, we are Canadian as well. We know a lot of things what, that we can sort of the globe out there. Can I just also add to that? Because we're Canadians, Ontario is a very diverse province. We had, uh, I can't remember how many years ago, but there was a plan. I think it was the um, car industry was saying we have $300 billion to invest globally. Um, to grow the EV and battery industry. None of that money was poised for Ontario or for Canada. None of it. Premier Ford and Minister Fideli, they said no, that's not going to happen because we have a gem in Ontario, and that's the Ring of Fire, which is we have the hot, the largest lithium deposits in the world located in northern Ontario. Oh, well. We do. So our mining industry pl decreased significantly in Ontario, but there is huge economic value for us to start getting back into the mining industry. Because of our aggressive nature in making sure Ontario is an economic powerhouse, and we are, because we are, if Ontario was a country, we are the third largest trading partner with America. Third largest. That's beside China and Mexico. Just Ontario alone. Think of it this way. You know, if you are in looking to invest in companies, if you're looking to, uh, you know, get into businesses that support our EV battery industry, now's the time because we have uh, opened up the, the highway. We've invested in the highway up to the north, which is a significant investment. We have invested in the train way. What is it called? The land, the train, the northerner. Yes. The trains now can get up to the north, which is unlocking the north to Ontario. We've secured Volkswagen, a huge investment in St. Thomas. So London and St. Thomas areas of Ontario are now poised for major development because people who work in, in Volkswagen are going to need homes and they're going to need all of the other support services to support a growing community. So that's an area if you're looking, if you're an investor, to think about expanding out to St. Thomas and, and London areas. Um, but because of our aggression, we've now secured $17 billion in investment in Ontario out of that $300 billion that was not even considered for Canada. So our government has done that. It's major. Yeah, yeah. And guess who is poised and ready to dominate these markets? We are. we are. That was Martha Stewart level information, just for those who understand what I'm saying. <laughs> As investors, that was your Martha Stewart guide to where to put your money. <laughs> that is where you want to put your money. That's incredible. Yep. So, yes. I also want to add one more thing is I'm looking at the diversity in this room with ladies. And there is one thing which I've tried before, is called being the trade bridge yes. to your own hometown. You know your hometown very well. I have done that in year 2000, trade bridge for, to China, helping Canadians to get, get into China at that time. So you have, you know your the place that you come from, and you know have a lot of people that maybe of good value for you that can support and get them as well as get to Canadian businesses. That is what digital marketing can support you as well. So go for it, being the trade bridge. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to say thank you again to you both for being here, for investing so much of your time to speak with us to answer our questions. And as a token, we have some fine gentlemen who are actually IT specialists. Thank you. <laughs> From us here at Stilettos and Hammers, I just, I wanna just tell you how 
completely appreciative and grateful we are to the both of you. And this is a very, you know, small token of our thanks. Um, also a female owned business here in Richmond Hill who has put these baskets together. Um, her name is AB Gift Basket. Um, she's got her information in the back. She's actually also a recipient of the Richmond Hill Business Achievement Award. Thank you again so very much.